our prehistory is 100% listener funded, so please consider becoming a patron of the show. For $3 a month, you gain access to exclusive episodes, maps, and timelines. Your support allows our exploration of prehistory to continue. To become a patron, click on the link in the description of this episode, or go to patreon.com slash ourprehistory. Flecks of sunlight dotted the forest floor. Through the understory, a narrow trail meandered between white and brown tree trunks. Two men traveled along the path, sweat trickling down their faces on this warm summer morning. They wore light deerskin clothing to protect their arms and legs from the prickly berry bushes. Each carried a bow made from pine wood. Made from tough reeds, arrows fletched with brown feathers and tipped with narrow stone points hung at their waist. Skilled hunters in their prime, they walked quietly and without stopping. They had left their small camp at dawn, leaving behind the rest of their band. Today would be their last walk on this trail for a while. Their group of eight would soon need to pack up camp and move, not wanting to linger once the edible plants and mushrooms of the surrounding woodlands were consumed. Descending a hill, the hunters approached an opening in the pine trees, which gave way to alder and willow shrubs, and then to a pond, encircled by reeds and grasses. Still under the shade of the trees, they stood, watched, and listened. Years of hunting together had given this duo a keen understanding of each other's subtle movements and cues. They were listening for telltale sounds of the forest giant, a moose, whose tracks they had spotted at this pond yesterday. If this animal didn't show up that morning, in the afternoon they would have to track deer or boar or go fishing upstream. But luckily for them, a rustle of grass reached their ears. Above the willow shrubs, they saw the wide antlers of an adult male. Adrenaline quickened their pulse. A moose could feed their band for about ten days, and they both knew that their next movements and decisions would be critical to success. The moose was not yet aware of their presence and one of the hunters crouched and quietly moved around to flank his prey. Once in range, he rose up, pulled back firmly on his bowstring, and exhaled deeply. These men lived 13,000 years ago in northern Germany, and were descended from migrants who had spread across Europe about a thousand years earlier, and who were well adapted to life in the temperate woodlands of the Bowling Alarod. Welcome to Our Prehistory, Episode 21, Bowling Alarod of Europe. After the glaciers of the Ice Age began their retreat, complex human societies had emerged in Europe. For 4,000 years, cultures like the Magdalenian and Mazinian had flourished. On the Italian and Balkan peninsulas, burials and art reappeared. The types of drawings, tools, and weapons made by foragers of that time period fit squarely within the Upper Paleolithic tradition of Europe, a tradition that had evolved for survival in the Cold Steppe. But then, around 14,700 years ago, the planet experienced a dramatic global warming, which began the climatic phase known as the Bowling Alarod. Over the course of the next 2,000 years, increased temperatures and precipitation drastically altered the European physical landscape. 
many Upper Paleolithic customs that had defined European hunter-gatherers for tens of thousands of years would gradually vanish. Most aspects of human life were reorganized according to a new set of values. The bowling alarod lasted from 14,700 to 12,800 years ago. From our perspective today, this period witnessed a significant simplification of technology and symbolism among European societies. What's so striking about this transformation was not only how dramatic it was, but also how widespread. This was the most significant European-wide cultural change since the spread of the Oreg nation about 25,000 years earlier. The name used to describe this shift in the forger way of life is Azilianization, which comes from the Azilian culture, the successor of the Magdalenian in France, northern Spain, and Switzerland. But Azilianization impacted all of Europe, including areas occupied by Magdalenians and Epigravedian hunter-gatherers. During the Bowling Alarod, the Magdalenian culture was replaced by a series of smaller local ones. Apart from the Azilian, the Fettermesser culture appears in northern Europe and the Epimagdalenian in Iberia. The Azilian, Fettermesser, and Epimagdalenian were primarily distinguished by strikingly different artistic paradigms. In southern and eastern Europe, the changes were less dramatic and more gradual. As a result, archaeologists continued to use the name Epigravedian even after Azilianization occurred. Not only was Azilianization a universal trend across the continent, but it also occurred simultaneously with a reorganization of social networks. The symbolic unity of the Magdalenian world dissipated, suggesting a weakening of ties between groups in southern France and central Europe beyond the Rhine River. On the other hand, the warming of the Bowling Alarod witnessed a renewal of cultural exchange between Italy and France, absent during the last glacial maximum. Azilianization was part of a major prehistoric transition, lying between the Paleolithic and Mesolithic periods. While most archaeologists consider the Azilian, Fettermesser, Epimagdalenian, and Late Epigravedian to be part of the Upper Paleolithic, they have sometimes been referred to as Mesolithic. It's probably best to view them as transitional cultures, combining aspects of both archaeological periods. Azilianization impacted many aspects of hunter-gatherer behavior, which we can summarize in four main points. First, hunting weapons underwent a major reinvention, with stone points replacing antler and bone points. Bows and arrows were widely adopted, replacing spear throwers in the post-Magdalenian cultures. Second, stone tools became smaller and were made using less sophisticated techniques and lower quality raw material. This approach allowed for quicker tool production. Third, naturalistic depictions of animals were abandoned. In some regions, symbolic expression became rare, and in others, original forms of art were introduced. And finally, fourth, the organization of hunter-gatherer bands changed, generally adopting a more flexible way of life. Flexibility is reflected in the occupation of a wider range of habitats, the utilization of a more diverse range of food resources, and the preference for small, short-term camps. These four changes, new weapons, tools, art, and patterns of settlement, reflect a dramatic societal transformation. Today, we'll look at the various regional expressions of azilianization and try to understand what this process meant to the individuals and bands who were living through it. To begin, will examine two major prehistoric events that took place during the Bowling Alarod, 
and which are considered the two fundamental causes of azillianization. The first event was the changing environment of Europe. Over the course of the bowling alarod, the landscape upon which hunter-gatherers built camps, hunted, fished, and gathered transformed dramatically. Rapid warming 14,700 years ago led to the accelerated retreat of the Eurasian ice sheet. Average summer temperatures in Switzerland increased from 9 to 16 degrees Celsius. Winters became dramatically less severe, with average temperatures rising from negative 25 to 2 degrees Celsius. By the end of this period, the southern shores of Sweden and Norway were ice-free. The meltwater from this mountainous glacier formed a large shallow lake where the Baltic Sea now lies, creating a barrier between the European mainland and Scandinavia. Land exposed by retreating ice became tundra, but further south, the increase in temperature was accompanied by an increase in rainfall, which resulted in shrubs and trees outcompeting drought-tolerant steppe plants. The expansion of trees across the continent was gradual, but by 13,000 years ago, at the end of this period, birch and pine woodlands spotted with meadows, bogs, and glacial lakes covered large parts of what is today Germany, Poland, and Russia. These conditions no longer favored large herds of reindeer, which disappeared from southern France and the Carpathian Basin at the start of the Bowling Alarod. Other cold climate and grassland fauna, like horses, bison, and mammoth, also decreased in abundance across the continent. In their place, temperate forest-dwelling animals migrated northward, including red deer, giant deer, moose, boar, and beaver. A similar pattern of forest expansion occurred in southern Europe. In the Italian Alps, glaciers continued to retreat, and pine and larch trees spread from the foothills up to 1,700 meters elevation. In the Italian lowlands, temperate trees thrived, including oak, linden, and elm, dramatically reducing the amount of open grassland. In Iberia, oak, alder, hazel, and willow multiplied. As areas of dry steppe shrunk across southern Europe, wild donkeys, aurochs, horses, and ibex gradually disappeared, replaced by red and roe deer and boar. The bowling alarod witnessed greater tree cover than at any preceding period of Homo sapiens occupation of Europe. It's generally accepted that the loss of Upper Paleolithic customs and the shift to a more flexible way of life with simpler stone tools and new hunting weapons was an adaptation to life in and around woodlands. Up until seven years ago, environmental change was thought to be the main driver of azillianization. But in 2016, the first major report on prehistoric European genomes was published and showed that about 14,000 years ago, right in the middle of the bowling alarod, a major wave of expansion swept through Western Europe. Groups of people from southeastern Europe, who were closely related to Epigravetians living in Italy, moved into lands occupied by Magdalenians. These migrants were descended from relatives of the man living 17,000 years ago at the site of Tagliente in the Southern Alps, who himself shared genetic affinities with people from the Near East. The discovery of this migratory wave complicates our understanding of azillianization. Were new hunter-gatherer behaviors adaptations of local tribes to the changing environment? or traditions spread by the expansion of a specific ethnic group. Older archaeologists referred to azillianization as a revolution in hunter-gatherer life. But today, experts shy away from this term. It's become clear that this transformation was gradual, with piecemeal changes accumulating over 2,000 years. So it's likely that some traditions were introduced by migrants as they moved across the continent. 
but other aspects of Azillianization were evolutions of local cultures well before and after the arrival of this new group. What's astounding about this Epigravedian migration is the degree to which Magdalenian tribes were overwhelmed. The genetic profiles of the people of Western Europe changed dramatically before and after this event. Up until 14,600 years ago, all Western Europeans for whom we have DNA shared a very similar Magdalenian ancestry. People with this genetic profile lived in Spain, France, Germany, and even on the margins of the Magdalenian world in Poland and the British Peninsula. Then, 14,000 years ago, as the Magdalenian culture ended, the first person with an Epigravedian genetic profile appears in Western Europe. A woman buried near the Rhine River in Germany, at a site called Oberkassel, has 85% of her ancestry from people like the man from Tagliente, and only 15% from Magdalenians, the previous inhabitants of the Rhine Basin. The ancient DNA of five other individuals, who lived between 14,000 and 13,000 years ago, shows a similar genetic proportion with most ancestry coming from Epigravedians. This migration reached Switzerland, France, northern Spain, and even Britain, where a person belonging to this new group died 13,600 years ago. We don't have any genetic evidence from Eastern Europe during this period, so it's difficult to determine the routes taken by these migrants. But the information we have allows us to draw the following conclusions. At some point between 14,600 and 14,000 years ago, large numbers of people moved from the southeast to the northwest of Europe and settled in lands occupied by Magdalenians, with whom they mixed to some degree. But the Magdalenians were far outnumbered and outcompeted by the newcomers there would not be a similar demographic replacement in Europe until farmers arrived from the Near East, about 6,000 years later. Although we don't know exactly what made Magdalenians so vulnerable to this incursion, it's not hard to imagine that their society, guided by practices and values that had served them on the harsh mammoth steppe, did not adapt quickly enough to a transforming world. Before the migration of the Epigravedians, there are some signs that Magdalenians attempted the adoption of new customs, including new types of hunting weapons, like barbed antler points and backed stone points. But these adaptations were not sufficient to contend with the migrants, who had developed a more effective lifestyle for the expanding woodlands. During the Bowling Alarod, a major transformation in the hunter-gatherer way of life took place. Various pieces of evidence contribute to this conclusion, including changes in hunting weapons. Hunters largely abandoned bone, antler, and ivory points. Antlers only remained in common use as barbed points. The persistence of this weapon reflects the continued importance of fishing. Invented by Magdalenians around 16,000 years ago, barbed antler points grew in importance among bands living from northern Spain to Poland, and appeared for the first time in the Balkans during the Bowling Alarod. As these examples of fine craftsmanship became more widespread, they underwent interesting innovations. From round and decorated with engraved lines, they became flat in cross-section and undecorated. Also, Azilians in France and Spain sometimes carved a hole at the point's base, indicating that they were being used as harpoons. Harpoons are designed to be thrown at and embedded within a fish or aquatic mammal. Upon impact, the point detaches from the shaft but remains attached to a string tied through the hole, 
allowing the fisher to pull their catch in by the string. Near the Atlantic coast of France, a zillion camps with harpoons also contain the bones of salmon. Classic azillion harpoons were short, less than 10 centimeters long, and were shaped like Christmas trees. Those of the Fettermesser culture in northern Europe tended to be longer, up to 20 centimeters, with less pronounced barbs. People used these to catch pike and perch in rivers and lakes. The difference between Azillion and Fettermesser barbed points is one sign of cultural separation between these regions after the Magdalenian. Fettermesser barbed points lacked basal holes and were probably fishing spear points, not detachable from the shaft. In fact, the residue of glue made from a mixture of beeswax and ground charcoal has been identified on the base of one harpoon found in Germany. Harpoons were not the only fishing technology undergoing change during azillionization. Fish hooks were invented around 14,000 years ago. Carved from ivory or bone and found at two Fettermesser camps in Germany and possibly azillion sites in France, these are the oldest fish hooks from Europe, but not the world. They may have been an improvement over straight gorges invented during the Magdalenian. Although fishing was important for many cultures of the bowling alarod, large terrestrial mammals remained the primary prey across Europe. Whereas Magdalenians had hunted them with antler-tipped spears, their successors used stone-tipped projectiles. Azillianization witnessed the spread across Europe of one particular type of stone point, called a curved-backed point. Curved-backed points were like microgravettes in that stone nappers blunted or backed one of the long edges, but different in that the backed edge was curved instead of straight. Typically, curved-backed points were only 3 to 4 centimeters long and less than 1.5 centimeters wide. They appeared first in Eastern Europe suggesting that they might have spread with epigravetian migrants into Western Europe. This weapon point dominated the remains of Azillian and Fettermesser camps and was used in smaller numbers in the rest of Europe, along with a variety of other styles of small stone points, including microgravettes. The consensus among archaeologists is that curve-backed points were used as the tip of arrows, even though no arrow shafts or bows have been discovered from this period. They base this conclusion on two pieces of indirect evidence. First, damaged curved-backed points bear fractures consistent with head-on collisions with animal bones, suggesting that they were attached to the end of projectiles moving at high speeds. Second, these points were too small and lightweight to be effective spear points. The small size of projectiles during this period is supported by another type of artifact. In northern Europe, a stone tool known as a shaft smoother has been discovered among the remains of 15 Fettermesser camps. These were sandstone blocks with long semicircular grooves carved into the surface. They are believed to have been used like sandpaper to straighten wooden arrow shafts. Importantly, some grooves were only one centimeter wide, too small for a spear shaft. This was probably not the first time that people used bows and arrows. Similar indirect evidence of this technology exists in older cultures, including the Salutrian, Aurignacian, and Ulusian of Europe, and the Howison's port of southern Africa. But interestingly, the primary hunting weapon of Magdalenians seems to have been a spear thrower, based on the widespread presence of spear thrower hooks in their camps, which disappeared from the archaeological record during azillianization. The transition from spear throwers to bows during the bowling alarod is generally believed to be the result of a shift in hunting strategy a consequence of a change in the main prey species of humans. 
with the rapid decline of grassland herds of reindeer, bison, and horse, people began depending on more solitary woodland species, including deer, moose, and boar. Magdalenians had hunted reindeer on the open steppe by drive hunting, using large groups of people to scare animals into strategic locations, where others were waiting to ambush them. Often conducted in the fall, when animals were the fattest, drive hunting could result in large numbers of kills at once. Dozens of people had to be organized to process the resulting carcasses, whose meat would have to be smoked or dried for storage. But mass-coordinated hunting mostly disappeared in Europe during the bowling alarod. Deer, moose, and boar did not congregate in large numbers, and finding them in wooded environments was less predictable. So it became more efficient for hunters to disperse into smaller groups, search for signs of their prey, and stalk them. This approach is called encounter hunting, and compared to drive hunting, it requires fewer people, less planning, and greater stealth. It usually results in a single animal killed at once, and the timing of successful hunts is not as predictable. Encounter hunting in forests favored a bow and arrow over a spear thrower for several reasons. First, Accuracy became more important, as hunting parties had fewer attempts at striking their target. Bows are more accurate than spear throwers. Second, bows are also stealthier, since less movement is required by the hunter to release the projectile. This quality became more important, as sneaking up on prey became more common. The preference for stone over antler as the material for the point might relate to the cost of production. Stone points can be napped more quickly than antler points can be carved, and since projectiles are more likely to be lost in a dense forest than in an open grassland, hunters gradually became less willing to invest in costly antler points. The adoption of encounter hunting led to shifts in social organization. Group sizes declined, bands moved more frequently, and meat storage became less common. We can see these changes in the archaeological sites of the Bowling Alarod. A zillionization is characterized by a notable reduction in camp size. Large Magdalenian and Mazinian style settlements with multiple tents and campfires disappeared, and camps in most of Europe remained small, sometimes with evidence of a single tent and fire. People gathered for social events in large groups less often, and operated in small bands of 5 to 15 people. Camps were occupied for shorter periods, as they moved to new locations more frequently. The behavior of new prey species led to the alteration of hunting approach, which resulted in wide-ranging changes to hunter-gatherer society. Smaller social units that moved more frequently and cooperated less often with other bands was part of a successful formula in this changing world. As centuries of warmer summers and milder winters passed, Generations of European hunter-gatherers slowly adopted new ways of living in the expanding forests. These shifting customs are not only seen in their hunting weapons, but also the tools they used around camp to butcher animals and work with skin, bone, wood, and plants. Stone tools became smaller and simpler to produce. This was especially true for knives and scrapers. During the bowling alarod, the objective of stone nappers gradually shifted from long blades of a standard shape to small irregular bladelets and short flakes. Eventually, they stopped using specialized techniques for producing blades and bladelets, instead embracing a single napping process for both. There's a noticeable decline in the preparation of core stones before removing flakes. If a piece required shaping after it was removed from the core, 
This was done by extensive retouching. Europeans continued making backed bladelets in large amounts to insert into a variety of compound cutting tools, including as barbs on arrows. This simplified approach to flint napping did not require as much skill or high quality raw material as that practiced before the bowling alarod. Interestingly, across the Epigravedian and Magdalenian worlds, stoneworkers stopped using hammers made of antler and bone to strike the cores, instead settling for stone hammers, which provided less control over the shape of the flakes, but allowed for faster tool production. Knappers were growing less concerned over making precise long blades and more interested in quick and easy tool making. Across Europe, it became rare for people to transport stone more than 100 kilometers, an indication that obtaining flint and obsidian from the best sources was less feasible or less necessary within these cultures. The microlithization of tools is best exemplified by scrapers. In most Upper Paleolithic cultures, these hide working tools had been large and rectangular. But during the bowling alarod, most scrapers were only about 3 centimeters long and wide. Across Europe, specific shapes of microlithic scrapers became common, including semicircular and thumbnail shaped. Thumbnail scrapers appeared first in southeastern Europe, suggesting that they might have spread with Epigravedian migrants into western Europe. As Europeans simplified the production of stone tools, they also spent less time working with bone and antler, especially where the Magdalenian had once existed. Antler spear points, pierced batons, and needles almost completely disappear. Only harpoons, awls, and spatula-shaped tools remained elements of post-Magdalenian cultures. Since people were carving and splitting bone and antler less often, they also made fewer stone chisels. Scrapers would come to far outnumber chisels among the tools left discarded at their camps. Both the organic and stone components of hunter-gatherer toolkits were becoming smaller, less standardized, and easier to make. This apparent technological simplification may be the result of a less structured hunter-gatherer society. Key resources like water, wood, and large herbivores were more evenly distributed across the landscape, meaning that people did not have to make specific long-distance journeys to access them. Also, the absence of mass hunts meant that coordination and cooperation between groups became less relevant for survival. These two factors meant that planning movements and activities was not as important as during the Magdalenian. As human behavior became more flexible, a preference for simple cheap tools may have won out over complex expensive tools. People could no longer anticipate when they would need to repair their hunting weapons and scrapers, so they needed quick ways of making tools without large blocks of good stone, which they may not have on hand when the need arose. In addition, the presence of forest itself probably contributed to the simplification of tools by altering the availability of key resources. Wood, scarce during the last glacial maximum, became abundant during the bowling alarod. We don't know how people at the time used wood, because it's rarely preserved aside from charcoal in campfires. However, as this material became more common, it may have replaced antler and stone for certain purposes. Azillianization may have partly been a shift away from a technology based on stone and bone to one with more wood and fiber tools. Furthermore, the thick forest vegetation likely reduced the visibility of outcrops making high-quality stone harder to find. Microlithization and simplification of napping provided stone workers with freedom from the need for large blocks of flint or obsidian. This freedom allowed for a change in settlement pattern during azillianization, 
not only were camps smaller, but they were more widespread across the landscape. While almost all Magdalenian sites in Central Europe were found within 10 kilometers of sources of high-quality stone or major rivers, Fettermesser camps were more evenly distributed. In other words, people of the Fettermesser culture were willing to live in areas avoided by Magdalenians. Exploiting a wide range of habitats may have been a particular quality of the Epigravedian migrants from the southeast that was facilitated by a flexible toolkit, and which may have led to Magdalenians being outcompeted. Simplification during the Bowling Alarod was not limited to tools, but also seen in symbolic expression. Across the continent, there's a trend away from naturalistic art, toward more stylized drawings of animals, and purely geometric forms. In most of Europe, art and ornaments were produced in smaller numbers than before, most noticeably in the former Magdalenian world. In France, azillianization intensified dramatically after 14,000 years ago, when the appearance of curved backed points and thumbnail scrapers coincided with the complete disappearance of depictions of animals. People no longer painted or engraved cave walls. Art became primarily portable and took on a dramatically simpler form. These objects were small river pebbles, usually painted red and sometimes engraved, most often with a small number of dots or straight lines, but sometimes more complicated patterns. A common, intricate motif resembled a line of stitches. Referred to as a zillion pebbles, they were only 3 to 9 centimeters long, and mostly oval or oblong. Painted obsidian pebbles have been found at 37 sites in northern Spain, France, Switzerland, and Italy. Modern interpretations of these stones range from the worldly to the mythological, from tokens for a game to a numerical system for tracking lunar cycles to symbols representing spiritual or magical forces. Although we will never know their true meaning, a zillion pebbles mark an important break in a long Upper Paleolithic tradition. The markings on these stones were always abstract. The preference for rounded pebbles over bone, antler, or flat stone plaques is another notable distinction from the Magdalenian. The immigration of new people from the East may have stimulated this dramatic shift in the nature and media of symbolism. In northern Europe, where the Fettermesser culture took hold, azillion pebbles were absent, and artistic production became remarkably depauperate, where Magdalenian Venus drawings and realistic engravings of Ice Age animals had once been common. But the handful of symbolic artifacts discovered, from Britain to Poland, revealed cultural similarities within this region. First, at seven sites, Engraved bones with long, repeated zigzag lines have been found. Fascinatingly, a bone with this motif was dredged up from the bottom of the North Sea, about halfway between Britain and the Netherlands, and radiocarbon dated, along with a harpoon, to the Fetter Messer period, proving that Doggerland was inhabited by humans at the time. Figurines of moose and horse represent a rare, but more complex form of Fettermesser art. Only three can be definitively assigned to this period, but they display a remarkably consistent style from the Rhine River to Poland. The animals held a strange pose. Their bodies curved unnaturally so that their nose touched their front feet. The most well-known of these was a moose carved from amber and found in Germany. These types of animal figurines were not common during the Magdalenian, again reflecting a major symbolic shift. Moving now to central and southern Iberia, another unique form of post-Magdalenian art emerged 14,000 years ago. Azillian pebbles were rarely found here. Instead, 
hunter-gatherers continued the Magdalenian tradition of painting and engraving animals, including on rock walls. But this art did not maintain the realism of Magdalenian drawings, returning to the stylization seen in Gravettian and Salutrian art. Legs were poorly finished, the size of heads was reduced, and few anatomical details other than antlers were depicted. Deer were by far the most drawn animal. To a lesser extent, triangular symbols and stylized human bodies with outstretched arms and absurdly long legs were drawn, revealing the emergence of a new artistic repertoire that would last in Iberia for several thousand years to come. The persistence of animals and cave painting in Iberian art bears a fascinating correspondence with both stone tools and genetics. In fact, archaeologists refer to this period of Iberian prehistory as the Epimagdalenian, due to the relatively minor changes in the toolkit used by hunter-gatherers in this region. Also, Iberia remained more genetically stable than France and Northern Europe during the Bowling Alarod. Iberians living after 14,000 years ago preserved a higher genetic contribution from Magdalenians, often more than 40%. Iberia, like other parts of Europe, did experience a wave of Epigravedian migrants from the east but the newcomers did not outnumber the local Magdalenians to the same extent. In fact, Iberians would continue to harbor the largest proportion of Magdalenian ancestry well after the end of the Upper Paleolithic. The greater resilience of Iberians to the incursion of the foreigners makes sense when we consider that they were never reindeer hunters like Magdalenians north of the Pyrenees and had not developed an economy and social system based on drive hunting. Therefore, the bowling alarod would have required less dramatic reorientation of customs within the indigenous culture, making them more difficult to displace along with their ancient Upper Paleolithic artistic themes. Along with drawings of animals, it's likely that the hunter-gatherers of the Iberian Peninsula held on to some of the mythologies and beliefs represented by those images. At the continental scale, a zillion pebbles and schematic drawings of animals marks a simplification in art compared to the monumental, naturalistic, polychromatic cave paintings of the Magdalenian. As with hunting weapons and stone tools, this shift provides an important insight into how azillionization affected social organization. Importantly, art of the bowling alarod required less talent and experience to produce than Magdalenian paintings and engravings. In other words, a wider swath of society may have participated in making decorations and images of ritual significance. Some academics argue that this was a time when fewer individuals were trained as artists. Bands of foragers may have also had fewer specialist craft people, based on the lower demand for skill in bone and stone tool production. Moreover, lack of specialization has been used to imply a decrease in social complexity. We already saw that hunter-gatherer bands became smaller and gathered less frequently in large winter camps. Fewer gatherings could lead to a loss of artistic and technological knowledge, and a reduced importance of art as an instrument for social cohesion. The trend towards social simplification was experienced in most of Europe, with one exception, the Italian and Balkan peninsulas. In fact, during the Bowling Alarod, the late Epigravedian of Southern Europe was characterized by an increasing amount of art and human burial. Azillianization occurred, but it was mostly seen in stone tools. Simplification of napping techniques and microlithization of tools follows the same pattern as the rest of Europe. Epigravedian foragers transitioned from bone to stone hammers, 
from blades to flake tools, and from exotic to local raw material. Thumbnail scrapers and curved backed points appeared in Italy and the Balkans at the beginning of the bowling alarod. But unlike a zillion Fettermesser and Epi Magdalenian bands who made small camps and moved frequently, foragers on the Italian and Balkan peninsulas developed a logistical system of movement, with large base camps which they occupied for months at a time. From these camps, they made forays to small, specialized camps, designed to collect specific resources. This settlement pattern is best exemplified in the Southern Alps, which were colonized up to 1,500 meters above sea level. Here, hunter-gatherers set up base camps in low mountain valleys, and hunted moose and deer. When excavating these base camps, Archaeologists often find large quantities of ornaments and arts, the remains of animals hunted in different habitats, and stockpiles of flint stored for future tool making. From the valleys, they made short trips to higher elevations, where they collected stone and hunted ibex in alpine meadows. Especially notable are short term mountainous camps where only rodents specifically marmots, were hunted to the exclusion of large herbivores. Camps focused on hunting small mammals were rare during the preceding Upper Paleolithic cultures, indicating shifting subsistence practices during the late Epigravedian. In fact, across the Italian peninsula, people captured small animals to an increasing extent. Large herbivores like deer and ibex still composed the majority of hunted animals, but the bones of fish, birds, and small mammals, especially rabbits and foxes, made up about 27% of the preserved bones in late Epigravedian camps, about twice as much as during the rest of the Upper Paleolithic. This diversification of the diet was occurring to some extent in other parts of Europe as well, including the consumption of land snails in Greece and France. The growing use of small animals foreshadows an even greater change in subsistence that will come in Europe during the Holocene, about 1,000 years after the bowling alarod. Diversification of the diet and logistical mobility may have been strategies used in the context of a growing population. Northern Italy saw a dramatic increase in archaeological sites around 14,000 years ago, as temperate and Mediterranean woodlands expanded. With the density of hunter-gatherer bands increasing, human graves, ornaments, and art grew in abundance. At least 45 burials at 11 sites dating to the late Epigravedian have been found in Italy, more than from any other period of the Upper Paleolithic. Most of the people buried were men and children, with only six formal burials of women. This seems to suggest different treatments of males and females in death, and perhaps in life as well, something which was not notable in Gravedian burials. Patrilineal descent, an emphasis of the male lineage, may have been present within this culture, because in graves at two different caves, an adult male was buried next to a child. As I mentioned last episode, these late Epigravedians followed the custom of burying people lying flat on their back. Ochre was sometimes sprinkled over the bodies, and grave goods, usually stone tools and beads, were sometimes placed alongside the deceased. One man was buried with a full toolkit, including a stone point, two flint tools, a core stone, pebbles, and most interestingly, a lump of tree resin, which he probably melted down to use as glue when assembling tools. The most popular beads used in jewelry were deer teeth and Mediterranean seashells of four particular species. There's a remarkable consistency in these materials used by bands from Greece to Croatia and Italy. 
at some sites shell beads are found in the hundreds. As with the quantity of burials, artistic production of the late Epigravedian exceeded that of any other period of the Upper Paleolithic in Italy. The art of this region contains a fascinating mixture of old-fashioned naturalistic drawings of Ice Age animals, alongside a new style typical of azillianization in the rest of Europe. These images were engraved and painted on portable items, usually stone pebbles, and on rock walls. Falling within the naturalistic school of Ice Age art, several aurochs were skillfully engraved from northern to southern Italy. These accurate depictions with exquisite detail suggest a Magdalenian influence that had been present in Italy before the bowling alarod. Gradually, this realistic style gave way to simplified drawings of animals, with less interest in anatomical details and use of perspective. For example, at two sites in the Italian Alps, hundreds of pebbles were painted with animals in dynamic positions, but with little care for correct bodily proportions. Other pebbles show humans and complex abstract patterns. Some of these were placed on top of human graves, clearly indicating the use of this art in funerary rituals. Across Italy, during the bowling alarod, human figures were drawn on small stones and cave walls. On some, men and women can be recognized. Other images are only vaguely human. Unique to this region were surrealistic depictions of humans, including an engraving of a woman with a horse head and paintings of men with mushroom-shaped heads. Also, among the painted pebbles of the Alps, two bear a highly stylized image of a human figure with multiple sets of zigzag arms. It seems that people here possessed a rich mythology full of strange beings. The most spectacular scene of human activity from the bowling alarod comes from a Daura cave in Sicily. It shows a group of animated men arranged in a circle surrounding two others laying horizontally. Fascinatingly, most of the men appear to have voluminous hoods behind their heads and large bird beaks, perhaps representing masks. Some hold long poles or spears. Next to the circle of masked men, a pregnant woman carries a large bag on her back, and a man holds several long sticks on his shoulder. This scene from Adaura may depict an initiation ceremony or some other activity in which only men participated. During the late Epigravedian, drawings of humans were far outnumbered by abstract art, which was found on cave walls and small pebbles. People painted and engraved intricate designs of meandering and straight lines and repeated motifs including comb-like and plant-like patterns. The complexity of these geometric patterns grew over time. Interestingly, at eight different Italian sites, from the Alps to Sicily, pebbles were painted in the Azilian style. The striking similarity to art made by people in France is strong evidence of cultural exchange during the bowling alarod. The painted pebbles found in France are older than those in Italy by a few hundred years, suggesting that this type of art spread from west to east after the migration of Epigravetians in the opposite direction. This contact is more evidence of a reorganization of ethnic and tribal boundaries in Europe during the Bowling Alarod, which was brought about by the migratory wave of people from the southeast. All across Europe, the Bowling Alarod was a time during which the status quo was broken. Old ways of organizing society and moving across the land disappeared, likely along with widely held beliefs about the relationship between humans, animals, plants, and the land. These changes were precipitated by a combination of environmental transformation 
and the spread of a closely related group of people. In the face of these unstoppable forces, ancient traditions were finally broken. In our next episode, we will finish the Upper Paleolithic of Europe and see how human cultures changed in the face of the final cold millennium of the Pleistocene. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider becoming a patron of the show. Your support will allow me to continue bringing you our prehistory.